Hi, I'm Paul Gray. Come explore Alaska with us and discover the diversity of its culture. In the land of the people of the far north, we'll travel 13,000 miles of roads to more than half a million square miles of Alaska's wilderness. From tundra to mountains, oceans, villages, and towns, from art to wildlife, glaciers to thousands of miles of rivers and lakes. Alaska is a place that breeds discovery. Hi, uh, I'm John White and I'm one of the owners and operators of the Chugach Outdoor Center. And we're going to go rafting today at Six Mile Creek. When you drive to Seward or Soldotna or Russian River, you're going to go past the Hope Junction. And there's a big, large concrete curb bridge over Canyon Creek, which is the major tributary to Six Mile Creek. River rapids are like organic roller coasters, I guess you could say. And whereas the roller coaster, you know the outcome, with river rafting trips, there's always an element of uncertainty. And imagine that you're going around the roller coaster and all of a sudden the tracks disappear completely out of sight and you're not quite sure where it's gonna go. Six Mile Creek is a remarkable raft trip from the standpoint of commercially guided whitewater endeavors. Because I see the same guests will come back more than once in the season. I think it's the only waterway in Alaska where I've seen that. Denali Park has some pretty popular raft trips and you'll see your guests come in, you know, you'll see, you'll, you'll see folks come back year after year. Six Mile Creek, they come back sometimes week after week, month after month. So it is truly a remarkable place. The white water there is simply unequaled. It is the best road accessible white water in Alaska, period. It's the crown jewel of road accessible white water. What I really like about Six Mile is that it has really great scenic values. It's truly a marvelous example of old growth coastal rainforest. Is it 100% safe? No, neither is traveling on the highway. Are the risks at Six Mile manageable? I think that's the best way to look at it and I think they really are manageable. I think that at Six Mile it's very important that you have the proper equipment. It is critical that you have a Type 5 life preserver made specifically for white water so that in the event that you do take a dip, a swim, that you're going to have a jacket that A, won't come off, and then B, does not restrict your movement or impede your ability to swim out of the main current. Um, you also need some type of, in addition to buoyancy protection, you need thermal protection. That's a big issue in Alaska, um, is that folks will wear a life jacket but they don't understand that the water is cold and that that can be as much of a threat to you as not having a life preserver. I mean, if you don't have a life preserver, you go underwater and you can no longer breathe. If you don't have a dry suit or a wetsuit, you're going to go in the water and you're going to get cold. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of risk there. So in terms of your equipment, your personal protective equipment, you need to have a good life preserver. At a minimum, a wetsuit, paddling jacket combination. Our, we prefer, we think dry suits are absolutely the way to go. We've, we've always outfitted our guests in dry suits and always will. They provide a higher level of, of safety and a m much greater level of comfort for our guests. Uh, you need a helmet and you need footwear that is, you know, reasonably secure on slippery rocks and won't come off if you have to take a swim in the water. My name is Jay Doyle. I've been a whitewater rafting guide up here in Alaska since the uh, early 80s and uh, I'm co-owner of Chugach Outdoor Center and we do uh, Six Mile Creek extensively and I've been floating that for 20 years also. The Six Mile is probably the most thrilling raft ride I've ever been on and I've been rafting pretty much all over the world. Um, it's one of the few rivers for a guide that it never gets boring at every level. There's different types of excitement and different problems on the river that keep your, keeps your attention at all times. Traveling down the six mile, I've probably done it uh, three or four hundred times. Uh, it, it never gets boring. With the six mile, we have a uh, cataract, which is a one man cat boat uh, that goes ahead first. It basically is the safety craft for picking up uh, people or, or, or seeing what's coming ahead. 
just basically the scout boat. And then uh, depending on what kind of boats you're using, you can be in a, a paddle oar boat or a paddle rafts. And they follow behind and basically what we do is we leapfrog down the river. The one boat goes down, eddies out and watches the other two go through and then they eddy out downstream and, and then the, the lead boat goes on. All our guides have quite a few trips down the river, like lots, and they all take swift water rescue training, they all have medical training, and they, they do this, they're true professionals at what they do, and this river requires professionals. Six Mile Creek at high water, it has the potential to deliver the swim of your lifetime. I mean, we, we're honest with people about that. I mean, for that reason, we make people swim at the start of the raft trip. They have to demonstrate to us that they have the physical ability to get out of the river. The swim test basically consists of a client. You wade out into the creek in the mid-channel. It's about thigh deep. You sit down in the water wearing your dry suit and your life preserver. You float 300 yards downstream. And then when you get to where our rescue boats, we want to see you float down river in your defensive whitewater position and then be able to roll over on your stomach and swim out of the main current into an eddy and then get yourself to shore. And if you were to fall in, you would want to think long and hard about what you're going to do as you go down. Um, pretty much what we tell people is to, is to hold your breath and not to freak out initially. And you pop up, the life jacket will bob you like a cork, and the dry suit pretty much keeps you warm. And you've already taken a swim, so you have an idea how this is working for you. Now you want to get your feet downstream in front of you when you see nothing but white water ahead which is waves and stuff that's too fast to even consider swimming to shore. Um, feet fend off rocks a lot better than your head does. Pretty simple explanation. And then when you see the water slow or you recognize an eddy from the safety speech, you pretty much roll over and swim sideways across the current and into the eddy. You have to swim hard because the water doesn't really want to let go of you. But, uh, in, in most cases, in, in the first two canyons, for sure, and, and pretty much at most water levels in the third canyon, it does slow down in points where you can get out. The stretch of white water that we do, depending on whether you do the two canyons or three canyons, of the, of the white water varies from, I'll say, six to ten miles. Uh, it takes probably about three, three and a half hours to, to do the, the, the shorter section and maybe another hour uh, to do the longer one. Each canyon gets progressively more wild. Uh, the first canyon is pretty much considered for class four. Uh, the middle one is class four plus, and the third canyon is considered class five whitewater. Known for being a couple of things, uh, very, very narrow. In fact, sometimes you can hit, hit both sides of the, of the canyon with your raft at the same time. Uh, it's, it's well known for big drops and uh, it's probably the best whitewater stream in Alaska. Depending on which, which boat you choose, you can go in a, a, an oar boat with paddle assist. And so um, a couple of people in the front will get the paddle. And uh, then there's a guide in the middle uh, controlling the boat with oars. And that's pretty much for something if you're a little more hesitant about floating on big white water, that's how you'd go. And the other choice you have is paddle rafting, where everyone is uh, is uh, paddling the, in the raft and the guide is in the back with a paddle controlling where you go a little bit. Uh, but basically that's much more of a team effort and you need to want to paddle. If you're in good condition, good physical condition, we always uh, propose the idea of paddle rafting over oar boating because basically it's more uh, participatory for the, for the client or the customer. Uh, the oar boats are, are probably maybe a little safer as far as being ejected out of the boat uh, than a paddle raft because you're hanging on instead of paddling. But um, both are pretty thrilling. An uh, oar boat, you know, if you just want to go down and see great white water and be able to look at the sights going down the river, that's probably maybe the better way to go. If you want the adrenaline and the paddling, then you could paddle raft. Because the guide has basically the sole means of propulsion of the raft in his, hands, in his or her hands, with paddle rafting, you got five or six people in the boat. Well, the guide has one paddle out of six. 
So yeah, the boat is under a certain amount of control at all times, but with oars, it is under a much greater level of control. People who are in paddle rafts swim much more with a much higher level of frequency than people who are in boats that are equipped with oar frames. So it, it, what it does is it gives, it gives our guests a choice. If you want the absolute maximum in whitewater action, paddle raft. If you want to participate but have you know, some options of, say, holding on and the boat still remains under navigational control of the guide, then an oar assist. If you go with somebody who's doing it day in, day out and has for quite a few years, you know, you're talking about a, a very safe, thrilling raft trip. This is the second Canyon Narrows of the six miles heading for what we call the waterfall. And there it goes, up and at them. And it's, uh, all these rapids are only probably 150, 200 feet away from the Seward Highway. Just below this white water section is huge eddies that you pretty much swim into no problem at all. And again, we always have the cat boat in front of us, so uh, rescue is right there. He's, that's his number one job, coming through what we call the nozzle. And uh, it's, a, it's a tight little fit. During the high water period, they bring you know, logs that brought down the river at a, a high rate. And uh, fortunately, they, most of the time, they jam up in very predictable spots, but we always are watching for them. Uh, here we move down to the second canyon and we're coming up to what we call the anvil. Um, it's a rock in the middle and a 90 degree left and as usual it's like where does the river go? And here they come in the battle raft going right through the anvil. And here we come up on a, a boulder and basically again it's maneuvering one way or the other to miss it. And as always you can sit right in behind the thing too. Uh, as they are right now. This creates a, a backwater and eddy. Eddies are, are spots in the river that uh, uh, you can sit and wait and park in. All of our clients are actively paddling in the boat when they're at Six Mile Creek. Many raft trips, uh, the guests or our passengers are just sitting in the boat, soaking up the rays and enjoying the view. Six Mile is a much more participatory experience. In terms of safety, I think it's got a pretty good safety record. Uh, I think it's not, I, I would not describe it as a stunt or something that's extreme because when I look at the kind of people who are doing it, we've had people in their, you know, 50s and 60s go down this river and really enjoy it. One of my favorite spots here, the little waterfall coming in on the side of the, of the canyon. And you always know that it's been wet out when this little creek runs because it dries up like most of the summer. And uh, later in the year, we like that water because it makes the river uh, higher and more exciting. We're pulling into an eddy, and sometimes it helps to grab hold of the trees. Uh, here, the oar boat is basically, they're bouncing around. You can see they're bobbing pretty good, but he's maneuvering. You can see, when you see a boat sideways like this, it's not that they're, they're out of control. I mean, they're, that's really how you maneuver. You set up, set up and then you'll turn the boat either straight forward or straight back to go through the wave. There's a natural tendency for people when they are going over a drop, they're going, they're entering the rapid, the natural tendency is not to paddle but to hang on. And the one place where you really want people to paddle the most is the very spot where their instinct is to hang on. So you got a conflict going on there. Human nature just want to hold on to the boat and ride it out. But in fact what you really want to do is you want to be paddling and bracing and controlling you know, and keeping the boat under power because it navigates better. I mean, if everybody stops paddling, there is no power to the raft. It's not under any kind of control. It's just a drift. You notice they're, most of them are working together as a team, and that gives you a lot, lot more momentum forward. Here they go, charging up, over, and through. That's a hydraulic a return wave there, and the more momentum you have, the easier you go through. And there. And they're going right through the narrows there.
Here's a log jammed in the bottom of the river, and these are things that you really, really have to watch out for. Uh, swimmers can get snagged on them. Uh, they're really, they can snag the raft, they can pin the raft. This is a, a hydraulic. You can see the white, the return, the, literally what we call the white water. Uh, the rock is just upstream of that, and that's literally water going back upstream that wants to hold you. And we are kind of sitting here as we go through. Physicists would call that, or a, or a, a fluid dynamics engineer would call that uh, a zone of helical flow, a place where the water is, you know, moving concentrically. So uh, there's quite a few drops like that in the river. A hundred or more would be my guess. Uh, the big ones have names. This one's the Beaver Drop. It's the last good drop in the second canyon, and it's uh, probably is named because somebody followed a beaver off of it. It's, it's hard for people to understand just when it comes time to paddle hard, just how hard we expect it. I call turns because I think it's easier for people to understand it. Um, you know, if you tell somebody that's in the boat right turn, that means turn the boat to the right as you're looking downstream. Tell somebody left turn. Uh, East Coast tends to say right forward, left back. Right side paddle forward, left side paddle backward. That executes the left turn. You know, or just left back because that'll execute a left turn. You know, left back, right forward. And if, you know, if I just call turns. Literally different strokes for different boats. Most of the time in rivers, uh, a hydraulic can suck you down, but it always flushes you out eventually. Um, other, other types of obstructions in rivers are man-made and they are much more dangerous. But in the, in the natural setting, uh, you usually can go through most anything. It's just a matter of how long you might stay there before you do go through. We have operational criteria. There's a gauge, there's a river gauge that the NOAA, NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and then they, admit they uh, manage the Alaska River Forecast Center. The gauge at Six Mile, you can access on the internet, which is fantastic, and the gauge is measured in feet, and at when it starts getting to 11 feet, we cease going, we shut down. Um, at that level, the likelihood of flips is significant. We'll take first timers through the first and second canyon. The third canyon is class five, and it's much more sustained in the event of a swim in the third canyon, you're going to go a ways. Um, so we'll take first timers through the first and second canyon because it's, it's what we call pool drop. Pool at the top and then you go over, you know, you go down the rapid which is obviously a place where the riverbed is dropping at a greater rate of elevation loss than in the flats. And then there's a pool at the bottom. Pool drop, pool drop. And the first and second canyon are characterized with pool drop type geography and we'll take first timers down that. And we evaluate, we've had, we've had first timers go all the way through all three canyons. This is Walker Creek. Uh, mining, there's a mining claim there and these are beautiful waterfalls, six of them all together that I know of. And some of the kayakers paddle down those waterfalls but we haven't attempted it yet. Now we're approaching uh, the third canyon. We're actually in the top of the third canyon and now we're going to hit some of the bigger drops. So the first one is commonly known as the Big Rock or Staircase, and it, it pretty much the name means everything. Big Rock splits the river and the, uh, the drops are, are immense. This is the Big Rock on the left, and we set up and we have to sneak right through here, and hopefully we won't do it backwards. Uh, down the first drop, this is a hydraulic. This is the lower drop of the, of the staircase. You probably the reason why it has its name. And off we go. Boom. They're going to do it a little differently than me. They're going backwards now. Backwards, frontwards. It, it works. When you're floating down here and you're coming into the wall hard, basically you have to get away from it. And there's two ways of doing it. One, you can take the bounce, get your boat turned in straight into it and hit really hard and you bound back really hard. Or the other, which is preferred, is you set up ahead of time and you row back or basically paddle forward whichever boat you're in. And you can miss the, uh, the obstruction and 
and go off. Either way, it never hurts to bounce. Here we go now. Watch out for this right hand wall. Back stroke, back stroke. Forward, home, yeah! yeah. Woohoo! And you can see the oar boat coming down through that drop. And they come up and see he's already setting up to keep from hitting the wall on the right. Sometimes, like I say, you can and sometimes you hit. You basically want to hit the big white water waves straight on because the strength of your, of your craft is the long way, not the narrow way. And uh, the difference can be very quick and occurring. You go in sideways and you swim. You go in straight forward and you go through like, like it was nothing. So it's real important to, to, uh, to position yourself properly. And the river, you try to take things on straight. You maneuver in between the waves and then you take them on again. That's right behind the, the rock. You can see the current rushing by, but there's lots of those in the river. And those are the rest spots and the safety spots and the places you swim to to get out of the water. This is just above the suckle, and that's an unknown, un unnamed wave there, and it's a big one. As we come down here now, now the adrenaline is really flowing, especially the guide, because they have an idea of what's coming more than than the, than, the, than the passengers. But the biggest, gnarliest wave on the river, the suckle, is downstream of us. They're eddying out here shortly, and we're going to move on down as the safety boaters. Basically, the suckle is a, is a hydraulic a return wave that goes entirely across the river, and you have to go through it. And it's just a matter of which spot you go through it on. Uh, you take it to the right, you slide right through, you go a little bit left, and you are stuck. Um, the biggest, longest time I've ever known a raft to sit there was an upside down one with nobody in it for well, close to 20 minutes. Back and forth, back and forth. Um, what it does is you, you're almost going, there it is right there. You're going off almost like a waterfall, and if you go through it, you bust through the return. The white is always water going upstream. And if you bust through it, you're fine. If you get caught in it, you'll, it'll kind of try to suck you back in underneath the current. And it's a very thrilling ride. Right in front of the, of the ore boat, as we could see coming down, you don't want to go right next to that rock because there's a nasty return wave that can hold you there and flip the boat. You can see they're moving just a little bit to the right. Boom, down they go. Bust through the white water here. And what wants to keep you, you can see they're paddling forward and off they go. The difference between doing it right and doing it wrong sometimes can be just a matter of, uh, of a couple of feet. There he's coming through again. And the cat boat, you know, it pops through next thing that we hit is called zigzag. These are big, powerful waves. Look at the guy down at the bottom. And they're, they're stalled for a minute. Look at them all paddling forward and off they go. And you see the waterfalls along the side of the canyon. There's lots of them as we move down the river. That was the zigzag behind us. These walls here are four or five hundred feet high. It looks like a jungle. It really does. It's most, one of the most beautiful places that I've seen in Alaska. And we're going to stop down here and eddy out and let everybody else catch up. Here's where everybody, we kind of all rendezvous here behind that big rock. And then we get ready for the next few drops. We have the merry-go-round. And then we have Jaws. And then we have the Let's Make a Deal at the end end of the trip celebration and off you go in the river dry suit floating like a cork that's the play spot it's a place where basically you flip the boat on purpose or you try to 
It's at the end of the trip. Everybody gets in the front of the boat. You paddle upstream where the water is pouring over a rock ledge and you just dive the raft into that pour over spot and you either get what's called an ender or you can get the whole enchilada and get the boat to actually flip. The most common comment I get from our guests at the end of the raft trip, they always, a lot of times, they, a lot of different folks from all different backgrounds say, my God, I can't believe I've been driving by this place all these years and I never knew it was here. Unlike the bear hibernating in its den, the ice and snow of Alaska's winter opens the land to mankind revealing new vistas hidden by summer. But the snow and ice of winter is not a cover, not a den. It is a playground presenting a new highway of opportunity. In South Central Alaska on the Kenai Peninsula, the people say, let the games begin. It's the Peninsula Winter Games. It's about the kids. It's about fast dogs. It's about strong dogs. It's about art. It's about competition. It's about winter fun. It's about cooperation, about coming together, about community effort, and all for the kids. It all started back in 1973. The late Mr. Al York, a member of the Soldatin Alliance Club, recognized the need to create an event where the local children would have an opportunity to enjoy sports, games, and kid-oriented events during the winter season. Over the years, some events have come, some have gone, and some have stuck around. One thing has remained constant. It's always been about the kids, about getting them outside, about putting a spring, or, or rather, if you will, a winter in their step. After the passing of Mr. York, the games did not die. John Torgerson picked up the torch, and with the help of the Soldaten Alliance Club and numerous volunteers, the tradition lives and prospers. John explains the evolution of the game. Myself and Bernice York decided that we would incorporate the games. We, we work to uh, bring young people in from all over the state to be involved in it. How about a one-horse open sleigh? The majority of the events occur in, or around, the Soldatna Sports Center. Hockey and skating inside, and outside, well, <laughs> the snow's the limit. Where else in the age of technology could one horsepower be the most fun? That's fun! Bye-bye! My name is Joe Gallagher. I'm on the board of directors of the Peninsula Winter Games. And with me are my friends Madeline, Genevieve, and Catherine. And we're just enjoying the day. The Peninsula Winter Games are really the highlight of the winter here on the Kenai Peninsula. There's really something for everyone. We've had a great day so far with plenty more to go. Let's go inside the sports center. Hi, I'm Andrew Carmichael, Parks and Rec Director for the City of Soldatna. Part of Peninsula Winter Games is a big ice hockey tournament. That brings kids in everywhere from um, eight and nine years old all the way up to teenagers sometimes, depending upon what teams enter. Alaska people tend to focus on their kids, and hockey is a sport that takes a lot of time to develop the skills and is a definite niche, if you will, uh, uh, an ability niche. But um, being loving the outdoors, they definitely love the indoors. And if you're going to walk on ice outdoors, why not play on it indoors when you can enjoy the hockey? Hockey's kind of like catching a football with the speed of lacrosse and the delicacy of golf, all while they're, somebody's trying to tear your head off. Come Peninsula Winter Games days, this place is hopping. We've got activities going on in the mezzanine, on the ice. Thousands of people travel through the sports center. Okay, back outside. Let's cool off. You've heard the term dead as a mackerel? Here's a twist. How about tossing a frozen salmon? The kids get three chances to hold on to a slippery, rock-hard salmon and go for the distance. <laughs> hey, where else can a kid get to play with their food? There's a toss. This kid wants to put some distance from her plate. In ice bowling, the ball is at least a little smaller than a bowler, and ice offers ready-made, slick bowling lanes. First one concentrates, and then one gets a little help. And just a few pins make you happy. 
Right next door to the Soldatna Sports Center is the ball fields. Some of the really old kids get to have a bit of fun here. Uh, first you have to identify a thing called a snowshoe, then figure out how to put it on. Next you incorporate this business into a softball game. Well the bat is the same, but the running is an art. First you hit the ball. Make sure it's in the air and not in a mitt. And well, then some people take their time due to age and still make it to the first base safe. Different styles emerge, and the rule of having the snowshoe on, well, it, it's loosely interpreted. The excitement builds up the road in the city of Kenai at the ceremonial start of the Tustamina 200. Starting line here at Kenai Chrysler Center in Kenai. Five, four, three, two, one, and our Tustamina 200 is up and running. At the ceremonial start, kids with disabilities are graciously chosen to be celebrity riders in the slips. John Torgerson fills us in on some of the history of that race. Working with uh, the local Chrysler dealership, Bob Favoretto, as general manager, uh, he was successful in talking Chrysler Corporation and Dodge into giving us, us and the uh, Tuscany 200 a, a, a nice donation to, to help make that happen. This 200 mile dog sled race is one of the qualifiers for the world famous Iditarod. Uh, the toughness of this race is due to elevation. It goes from near 300 feet to nearly 3,000 feet. Another part of the Peninsula Winter Games is the Native Youth Olympic Games. The Gagoyne team of Kenai have a regional competition. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, the natives of Alaska depended on skill, endurance, agility, and the balance of mind and body. Survival meant hunting and gathering. Each individual had to contribute to the best of their ability. The Native Youth Olympic Games provide that cultural touchstone. Throughout history, these games were the training ground to practice the skills needed to survive. Oh, there is competition, but the overall goal is to achieve one's personal best so everyone contributes to the whole. And in that sense, the end result is cooperation. Cooperation that has sustained the Alaskan Native cultures for thousands of years. The history of the Peninsula Winter Games reaches back only decades, not centuries. But that same spirit of cooperation lives, awarding to the kids of today the potential to pass their culture on to the succeeding generations. Among the other events are log sawing contest, broom hockey, ice cube hunt, and many more. Okay, let's step up the horsepower and go to the dog power. It's the Al York Memorial Junior Musher Sled Dog Race. This race is open to kids under 16. John Torgerson tells us how Al York, the founder of the Peninsula Winter Games, started the Junior Dog Sled Race. I think this was a very important thing that Al wanted to see continue on was uh, the dog sled race. It's, it's probably one of the more difficult games that we put on because it, it, it is hard to actually get out and, uh, and get kids. Uh, a lot of kids like to try it, but most of them don't have a dog team. And, and it's just something you just can't go borrow from your neighbors. It's important to us that we maintain the culture and, and some, of the, some of the things that, uh, that the youth of our state have, have been involved in and give an opportunity to that to pass it on to someone else. So. These could be the future mushing stars of Alaska. Well, they already know how to take charge of their own sled. All this sled needs is a dog and a kid on the other end and he's off. It's just really fun to be on the sled and behind the dogs and going down the trail fast. You're teaching uh, sportsmanship and uh, you know how to get along with each other and, and, uh, and to some degree the family sense by coming out to these things. I like about racing that you can go fast and you can race the dogs. I just like being around the dogs and I like competing. It's a sense of accomplishment, you know. It, we measure as adults our accomplishment maybe by how big our paycheck is, but their measure of success and accomplishment uh, is just doing it, going out and participating. 
And of course, one of the things that we really wanted to do throughout all this was to keep the original intent of the games alive and well, and that was working with youth. So most of the activities that we do uh, are, have a, a, a huge involvement with the young people of our state. Uh, clearly, we named it Peninsula Winter Games to involve the entire peninsula. Barbara Blakely, Peninsula Games president, takes us to... The Leland Chumley Memorial Snow Machine Rides. These are two of Leland's cousins that are, that are uh, giving the rides. Leland used to help us out uh, and give these rides himself. And he was uh, killed in a motorcycle wreck. Now his cousins and friends get together to do these rides each year in Leland Chumley's honor. Kick sledding, popular in Finland since 1928, has suddenly emerged in Alaska. Kick sledding is a new event for kids to experience at the Peninsula Winter Games. Sleds, free to ride, are available for anyone to try. It's a scooter on ice. And speaking of scooting, this is how it's done with an internal combustion engine. But this is for the big and little kids. It's called the annual Lion Snowcross. Here is the game. It's held at the Twin Cities Raceway in the city of Kenai. It's up and up and sometimes down. Also in Kenai. Well, good morning. My name is Bob Freitas. I'm the Parks and Recreation Director for the city of Kenai. Today, this morning, we're at the Kenai Golf Course, or otherwise the Kenai Nordic Trails. Uh, we're here this morning to uh, kick off our relay race and our uh, ski jer race. Did I win? In the ice fishing derby held at nearby lakes, kids can delicately put their hopes on the end of a line and... At the end of the ice fishing derby, prizes are awarded and recognition given to all participants. Back at the sports center, it's the figure skating. Some show style, some put on the dog, and some show grace. And then the awards. Where else can you dance with a polar bear? There's Carol Martin again. Each year, Martin donates his time and energy putting groceries into youth. John Torgerson is on the job at the chef's table. Most of what we do are, is inside the sports center, but we have a big banquet for the Tustamina 200 and the Mushers Draw and all that uh, business. And then we have uh, Peninsula Winter Games has a, a, a dinner for the children and also a, we serve a breakfast for, for the children. And, and uh, we, uh, for years, uh, kids were free, adults pay, uh, kind of a, a, a methodology. Uh, we're now uh, to help defray costs. We, I think it's uh, like five dollars that we we charge for a Peninsula Winter Games button. You get a T-shirt and a bunch of coupons around town for things you might be able to buy, um, and, and both dinner and breakfast uh, served for the same. Just as long as you have your button. So it's it's uh, it's a it's a heck of a deal for kids and a good deal for parents. After the sun goes down, the temperature may be cold, but the atmosphere is warm. The night is lit with a huge bonfire. Inside, away from the cold night air, the boyos and the Colleen's are, are treated with Irish singer Seamus Kennedy, sponsored by Sweeney's Clothing. Monopoly is a game where you can drive people to ruin, destroy their hopes, send them into bankruptcy, and carry away all their property. Yet at the end, it's all in fun. This game of chance has two categories, one for those fun-loving kids and one for those mean adults. This must be an Alaskan dog. He wants to pull. Alaska dogs are happiest when they're working. This is the state championship dog weight pool. Happens every year here on the Kenai Peninsula at the Peninsula Winter Games. The challenge is for the dog to pull a sled full of nails. Each time more weight is added to the sled. It's like raising the bar on the high jump. How these dogs really get into the competition. 
But the latest major attraction, drawing contestants from places far beyond the Kenai Peninsula, is the Ice Sculpture Competition. I'm Jerry Neer, and I've been a resident of Alaska since 1961. Great many activities that are going on during these winter games. We are just looking for this ice sculpting and ice cutting thing to be probably that anchor event. We have found that old gravel pits that contain no vegetation and no fish develop the most crystalline ice because there's no vegetation or decaying that uh, puts bubbles into the ice. To cut the ice cakes, we need to set the saw depth so the saw cuts just short of uh, going all the way through. Our, our first year of sculpting, we used chainsaws in a traditional way, trying to cut a line and the cuttings would just uh, obliterate the chalk line. So using our experience from that, we designed this cutting rig and put that together. And now it's set up to cut so that we can follow a line. The uh, chain cuts on the way down. And so it doesn't mess up the, the line, the chalk line that we snap. And uh, there's a sight on this cutting jig and we can follow a line. The trick is, do not cut all the way through so that you don't need to worry about water coming into your saw cut. Well, the water will freeze up the chain and it's sort of like a lubricant and then it brings slush into the saw cut and at 32 below it freezes in about two minutes. Then it has to be recut. We use antifreeze in the chain bar oiler and that keeps the chain from freezing to the bar as we go move from one cut to the next because there's always a little bit of heat generated and the antifreeze keeps the bar free. It's rather cold. It was 32 below zero, and uh, we were still able to cut the ice. Uh, we called Fairbanks, and, which is usually quite a bit colder than we are, and they indicated they do not even think about cutting ice until it's above zero. Here we had some 30 people out there on the ice at 32 below, cooking hot dogs, frying hamburgers, and uh, doing what it takes to load up 40 of these uh, three or so plus ton blocks. Rotary Club project and Rotary has been responsible for cutting the ice and get it loaded but we have a local companies that donate their equipment, boom trucks, forklifts and they help us get it loaded and transport it to uh, where the uh, blocks are to be carved. This year we've had support from a company on the North Road, r &K Industrial and they came in with two forklifts that are able to pick up 7,000 pounds at a distance and that's the only way that we have found that we can successfully get the ice out of the hole. These blocks weigh between three tons and a little more. Well, this year, because of the cold, the minute the ice was uh, taken out of the, of the pit, um, it would fracture because it's going from relatively warm to 30 degrees below zero plus, and it just would fracture. So it had to be handled very, very carefully or it would just break the temperature differential will just cause the ice to fracture. And of course we have Norm Blakely, he is sort of the main ramrod of this whole thing because he takes it from where the Rotary Club leaves off and brings in the rest of the community in the way of the Chambers of Commerce and different businesses and spearheading the effort to have different businesses sponsor carving that is uh, you know, performed right in front of their place of business. This year we were really uncertain about the quality of our ice and so we have a source of ice that comes from Fairbanks, also out of a gravel pit. And some of our local freight companies haul that down there for us free. Setting the ice, sometimes we have to use a sling. And we have to notch the corners of the ice block so that uh, the sling does not slip off. Setting these three ton plus blocks in various places, we need to be assured that they stay in place and eliminate the danger of being able to tip over. And so once the blocks are set, we make a slush with water and they are frozen to the ground and they are pretty stable. Well, winter is our dominant season here, of course, but Alaskans take that in stride. This year is for local businesses to be able to hire carvers and uh, the ice was donated by Winter Games and the carvers were paid fee to perform these carvings in front of different businesses. This was, I think, a first. Uh, here it was 32 below, and the different businesses um, contributed to some of the cost of this, but the Winter Games paid the Rotary Club 
a thousand dollars for these 40 blocks of ice and I think that's the first of being able to sell ice in Alaska when it's like 30 some below outside. <laughs> We've been able to attract carvers from from outside from the Seattle area and other places plus they come down from other parts of, of Alaska. Carvers are of international reputation and uh, some have won national championships in snow sculpting. We have a list of some 25 or 30 different carving teams and we send out our invitations and we take very good care of them. Local businesses house them for free, beat them for free, very well received. In Alaska this last winter we had fairly heavy snowfall before the ice froze very thick and uh, the water came up and we call it overflow and that gives the, the milky component to part of the ice. Uh, we've had some carvers that just decide to cut off that part and just to use the crystalline ice. We had a team, for example, that did uh, salmon going up a waterfall. That was part of, you know, the entry uh, decoration going into where most of the rest of the carving was done at the sports center. I'm uh, Jim Brown from Anchorage, Alaska. I'm an electrical contractor. And uh, I started doing this a few years ago and kind of got hooked on it, so I've been uh, stuck here ever since. We're trying to block it out right now. I can't take too much too much out of it yet until the last day. This is actually going to be a little girl on a swing set. So I'm just trying to get the parameters down where she's at. She has to balance on her feet. And uh, she's going to end up probably weighing about 500 pounds when I'm done. And it's got to be balanced pretty dang close or she'll fall over real quick. And I don't want that to happen. Riley Bryant, I'm from Chugiak, Alaska. I'm a cabinet maker. We're going to carve a Lord of the Rings. This is going to be Smeagol or Golem. We're going to do the, the two towers in the back from Lord of the Rings. I'm Linda Gensel and I'm from Palmer and I'm carving a, with my partner, a, a trapper. carve wood. I've been carving wood for about five years. This is a snowpack. An old-fashioned, going to be an old-fashioned snowpack. What's a snowpack? Snowshoe. Okay. But the old-timers call them snowpacks. Just rough it out and, and then you detail it. There's a time frame we've all agreed on and they have two and a half days to finish the sculpture and so some of these people will work well into the into the evening sometimes even uh, in the early morning and then are up early the next morning uh, just to meet the deadline. The competition as we call it awards prizes on a first second third basis plus uh, uh, what we call the people's choice. Uh, the carvers through a criteria that we've all agreed on are the judges but they cannot judge their own piece. And there's a scale of one to 10 that they award on a, maybe a six or eight different criteria. And then the highest score is the winner. It's interesting, last year, the best carving was awarded to the dolphins by the carvers, but also it won the people's choice. The ice that uh, is preferred by carvers is what we call crystalline ice that has no fracture and no uh, gas bubbles in it or vegetation. When the sunlight hits it in the daytime, it'll show up blue very translucent and transparent at night. Um, you can read a newspaper through three feet of this ice. The final finish on these sculptures is uh, conducted by using a, a, a torch, sometimes just a small hand-held one, or sometimes a, a regular uh, flamethrower burner. And it melts it on the outside and it comes out just very, very nice. It covers up the small tool marks. Just the heat differential is enough to cause the ice to fracture and they can lose their whole sculpture. On the dolphins, there was a hollow ball that they carved out of ice with a small dolphin inside. And they just finished that and they set it aside. Well, that day the sunlight came out and the ball fractured because the sunlight struck it. So they finished and put the last, they did it again, but they put the ball on top of the dolphin's nose at night sort of a diversity in the vision of our different carvers. We have one individual, Spiro Stevens, 
that he's a visionary and he's able to create something that does not exist. A lot of the other carvings are sort of representational about things that all of us already can, uh, can identify. But Spirio, he is out and he is creating things that have never been done before. And uh, it's, I think, in the true sense, of, uh, probably what really art is about, to come up with things that are very different. We had one carving of two woodworkers with a power saw just sawing up boards. Actually, it's two carpenters that are, uh, and our theme is the uh, Ufa boys. I'm Scott Hansen, and I'm actually a chainsaw carver um, outside of town here. And i uh, got my own business, and I actually do carve for a living. I do bears and eagles, and mostly for tours that come through the summer. Oh, what I like about ice, uh, it's quick, it's fast, it's, uh, it's like carving butter. Um, it's, uh, you can fuse things on. If you make a mistake, you cut it off, you fuse it, you uh, make another piece similar to fit it, and then you fuse it. We have a team from, uh, from the North Slope that work as, as chefs and cooks, and part of uh, their activity is to carve dinner pieces that go on the tables up there out of ice, and that's sort of how they've got into this in the first place. Dave Sauer, uh, my, myself and my partner are chefs with Nana up on the slope. I live in Anchorage, and he lives in Washington. Tony and I have been carving competitive probably the last 12 years. There'll be a lake like that, and then it'll have uh, leaves and grass and um, campus grass and cattails and uh, like a bunch of water around it with the lake and then a ducks and we're gonna have a loon with a nest and a swan and a baby swan. They have a wide variety of tools. In some cases they use woodworker tools. Some even have some tools that they do for dental work. Sort of like a plane or, or a scraper board for leveling and uh, it's, it's kind of an uh, interesting thing just to watch how they work and, and the experiences that, uh, that they bring. They just shave the ice because any kind of impact on this ice will fracture the whole piece. And this is going to be the moon and then we're going to fuse the stars on top, three or four high, like this. Some of these people have a, like a little squeeze bottle with a, with a very, very uh, sharp nozzle and they can rebond some of these fractures by just getting a little water in there. We love ice. Viva ice! At the end of January and into the early days of February, while the bear sleeps and the snow sparkles bright, the temperatures may drop, but Alaskan spirits from all over the state can rise in the playground called the Peninsula Winter Games. <laughs> Give a fish a reason and it will bite. Give a fish a person, ladies welcome a fish and they will scream. What is it like to catch a big king salmon? Imagine you have a clothesline connected to a sleeping elephant. And then it gets up and runs. Hang on, lady. The fish are big, the river is big, the state is big, the thrills are big. Is bigger better? You can bet both break up boots and your Saturday best hat. This is as good as it gets.
How big? Big. On the Kenai River in South Central Alaska, we're talking real big, super big, world class, jump in your face, double your ride, muscle screaming, heart pumping, big. These fish don't reel in like a wet pair of long johns. We aren't talking northern pike, we are talking kings, king salmon, chinook. Now, can we brag a bit? Why not? This is Alaska, bigger than Texas. We claim bigger bragging rights. We have more daylight to burn, more water to run, more wilderness to get lost in, more bears and kids in the playground at recess, and fish bigger than Great Danes. Our street people are moose. Our fish are homegrown kings. World class, record holding, fight till dark, kings. That's a big fish. The Kenai River runs 82 miles from the Kenai Mountains to Cook Inlet. Near its mouth are the thriving towns of Kenai and Soldatna. It is a fast flowing river fed by these big last all summer ice cubes called glaciers. The result, a magnificent turquoise color. The Kenai River watershed drains 2,200 acres of mostly boreal forest. Mountains, fish-filled drainages, wildlife, beauty, it tends to attract folks from all over Alaska and the world. 64% of all fishing in Alaska takes place on the Kenai River. Patience, the fisherman's tool. Patience and luck brings Okay, how do we train these big kings to do tricks? Actually, it is more the dog walking the person. The people who have learned these tricks are the guides. Guiding on the Kenai River a couple of decades ago became a business. Some of these guiding businesses have become family operations, like this one here. Second generation, sons taught by father. They make it look easy. Sometime before the 1970s, not many people paid much attention to Kenai Kings. Hooking one from the bank proved to be as productive as catching a train with a butterfly net. 40 to 90 pounds of unwilling to cooperate hard driving fish in a strong current tends to demand a boat. Family secrets can bring home those oversized Kenai Kings. Statistics prove your odds of catching one of these record kings is 10 times better with a guide. The guides use the best equipment, are on the river every day, and have generations of experience behind them. Eighty-two miles. The Kenai River offers kings and more, but most of the king fishing is on the lower 40 miles. The upper half is still mainly wilderness. The fish have brought development on the lower half, and manners. That net held up means a fish on and brings smiles all around. When the bite is on, the boat may runneth over with smiles and pounds. Exactly how much do these Kenai Kings weigh? Well, 30 pounds is light, 50 pounds is acceptable, 70 pounds and up is the quest. The record is 97 pounds, four ounces. This youngster gets a close look at his catch. Who weighs more?
These big fish don't discriminate. Landing a king can take from minutes to hours. People still talk about one fish that was hooked for three or four days but never landed. Kenai kings are a net full. Of course, you have to pose and do a little weightlifting after success. Even Senator Ted Stevens draws attention to this world famous river. It's the greatest king salmon river in the world. As you can see, catching a king is not a lonely sit down job. Fast water and hard driving, diving and jumping. Big fish make you pay attention. Someone operating the boat doesn't hurt either. Why are the kings so big in the Kenai River? Research is putting the puzzle together. Starting here at Kenai Lake, the source of this famous river, it travels down a narrow whitewater canyon through Skelac Lake and continues through a diversity of geography, from wilderness to riverside lodges and restaurants, from mountains to the sea. The length, the lakes, the glacier-fed influence, water temperature, spawning habitat, all contribute to the existence and survival of the king salmon. Many of the king salmon spend their first year of life in the two lakes before migrating to the sea. On the upper river, it is more spawning grounds than king fishing, but there are alternatives. A trip on horseback offers an opportunity to see the river without starting up your engine or stroking an oar. A romp through the water using only one horsepower. Not an alternative method of trolling for kings, but a great way to add diversity to your day The river draws more than a few celebrities this way. Hal Ketchum, country singer, second from the right, waits for his boat partner to land a king. He could be wondering why this particular king chose the wrong hook. Wondering about kings in this part of the country is more than an occupation to most of us. Fish counts, water level, weather, and information about fish is common cracker barrel conversation. Water level is an interesting topic. Most rivers in the world have lower levels in the summer. Being glacier fed, the Kenai water level rises around the end of May or so. The salmon take the clue and come back from the sea they come. They don't pencil in the day on our calendars, but as spring develops, attention turns to the river. Yeah! A few hardy souls get on the river in early May. The first salmon caught is big news. Hopes start to rise, tackle boxes are dug out of closets, Excuses for missing appointments are made and slowly boats start to grow on the river. Once in the net, another decision is whether to catch and keep or catch and release. Hmm. What is a lady to do? Well, now then, there. That must be a keeper, she says. This one a keeper. Let's take a guess at the weight. Hmm, uh, 44 pounds, 6 ounces. A good day, a great fish. Salmon take on dramatic changes during their life cycle. When the spawning salmon start to turn red and the jaw starts to hook, out come the oldest, most experienced fisher folks on the Kenai. Fishing mostly at night, when people aren't around, the bears have a different method of catching their share of the salmon. The no hurry method is used when the fish are easy pickings in the shallows. When the salmon are plentiful, the bears, being gourmets during the feast, often eat only the eggs. But into late fall, they have no problem with feasting on old carcasses. Oftentimes, it seems to be just play chasing the fish up and down the river in side streams. The submarine method is effective. No snorkel and mass needed. Just watching them, you have to think the bears get as much enjoyment out of fishing as we do.
And then there are the people tournaments. This fish took first place in one of the midsummer contests. It took about an hour to land this beauty, making this fisherman's trip from the lower 48 worthwhile. Let's take another guess at weight. Hmm, uh, 51 pounds, 6 ounces. Okay, we knew. We saw this one weighed. As the morning mist burns off the upper Kenai River with the day promising sun, we launch a drift boat into the water at mile 69.4 at Jim's Landing. The last place to pull out below Kenai Lake and the only place to put in to run the Wilderness Canyon down to Skelac Lake. King Salmon moved quickly through this section to spawn, but this is trophy rainbow country. This guide will take us down the canyon. This section of the river is no motors allowed. Not a real wild section, but one to approach with caution. The first stretch is rocky and bumpy. Hang on. The bumps don't last long. Smooth water coming up. Looks like a fish spot ahead. There's a nice flat level table in the river here, and so the fish will hang out in this zone between the two sets of rapids. And a lot of sockeyes do spawn in this, this kind of gravel structure. Well, one of the things about Alaska that's so different than just about any other part of the world, in the modern day world, is that we can live here with all the conveniences of the 20th century at the same time we can hop in a drift boat float down the river like we're doing this afternoon be totally immersed in the wilderness and then go right back to our houses again the uh, sockeyes run through here of course um, a good portion of the sockeyes that uh, spawn throughout the upper upper river uh, spawn right here in the last mile above Skelac Lake and uh, the fishing of course for the trout is is good throughout that time period that they're spawning. Kings do spawn through here though not nearly as many as uh, I believe spawn below Skelac Lake but we start seeing kings in, in this stretch of the river in late June and and throughout July and August uh, often porpoising and, and spawning in some of the holes adjacent to where we're trout fishing. Silver is seem to pretty well move through this stretch. They don't spend a lot of time in this part of the river, although there's a few little holes where uh, we find them stacked up a day here, a day there. And a lot of Dolly Varden move in out of Skelac Lake and uh, both spawn in this stretch of river as well as uh, come in to feed in the uh, early part of the year on salmon fry and then of course on the eggs once the salmon are spawning. Unless you are an eagle, this is not a productive part of the river for salmon fishing. But this part of the river is still important. When it comes to perpetuating the life of the king salmon, no one part of the river is more important than the other. The canyon is an important corridor for migration and spawning. In turn, the salmon contribute to the other species of the fish in the river. Several patterns of artificial flies are effective in the canyon for rainbows all imitating complementary contributions of salmon, the flesh flies and the salmon egg flies. The fly that I'm using right now is a little bit of rabbit fur made to look like a piece of salmon flesh that's just come off of a carcass. It's probably the most popular fly to fish at this time of the year. What the salmon leave, the rainbows use. The canyon, only four miles long, offers quite a different view of the Kenai River. Fly fishing is seeing increasing popularity in Alaska. In conjunction with catch and release, fly fishing is bridging the gap between conservation and sport use of a depletable resource. 
Alaska has abundant opportunities, but it has an inherent weakness in its ecosystem. True, you have to be robust to survive the short summers and the long, often cold winters, but these same conditions make survival tenuous. There are big rainbows in the Kenai, but because of the short season, they grow slower and would probably go the way of the trumpet or swan down south if not managed. Like the king salmon, the rainbow share this river with Dolly Varden and the other four species of salmon. All the rainbows in these waters put up a good fight and they recover quickly if they're handled properly. The canyon is much more tranquil than what most people experience. The float comes to the end at Skelak Lake. The river branches out into several channels, one of which is the terminus of Hidden Lake Trail, a short mile or so walk down from Skelak Lake Road. During the salmon run, the Chinook, Sockeye, and Coho that don't spawn here take a final rest before their trip up the canyon to spawning places above. Skelak Lake is the other winter rearing spot of salmon, fed by its own glacier at the east end it donates its share to the slight difference in color between the upper and lower river. Kenai National Wildlife Refuge surrounds most of the lake. Hiking trails are on both sides. A day on foot with a pair of binoculars can add anything from a rare bird to a moose. The first mile or so feeding out of Skelak Lake is closed the motors the first part of the season. Some people come just to watch the birds. You might even see a beaver. But back on the lower river, the action is big and fast. We still haven't answered the mystery of why these Kenai kings grow bigger than anywhere else in the world. As we all know, salmon are born in fresh water, spend the first year at home, and then go to sea. These Pacific salmon come home one time to spawn and die. A current theory is that Kenai king salmon stay at sea a year or more longer than kings that return to other drainages. Kings become sexually mature anywhere between their second and seventh year, which means the fish in any spawning run may vary greatly in size. A mature three-year-old weighs three pounds. A mature seven-year-old salmon may exceed 50 pounds. Unlike humans, females tend to be older in maturity than males. The pieces of the puzzle are still being assembled, but we know more now than we did many years ago when all we knew then was that Kenai kings are big. Do Kenai kings stay longer at sea? Are they sexually mature later in life? Do we have a habitat that is superior to other drainages? Down in the lower 48, some salmon stocks have disappeared due to loss of habitat. Streams were clear cut, destroying bankside rearing areas and raising water temperature. Streams were dammed, reducing current flows and blocking the return to places of birth. Wetlands were drained for development. Pollution from industries into feeder streams poisoned water. So far, we are aware of what not to do here in the Kenai, and maybe we have all the right ingredients to keep on turning out world-class salmon and keep them running fast and hard like this one. Remember that 97-pound, four-ounce record we talked about in 1986? This is Les Anderson, the pioneer who caught said Moby King. 
He and his brother-in-law hooked on around 6.30 a.m. For a half an hour, the fish took them upstream. Three times they tried to net it. Three times it fell out of the net and swam away. Finally, they gave up on the net. They beached it. Assuming it was just another big salmon, they fished another three hours. Less his previous best with a 63 pounder. At the end of the fishing day, they were urged by others to have it weighed. One scale led to another until the final official scale, six hours after it had been caught, confirmed the 97 pounds, four ounces, beating the former record out of saltwater in Juneau by three pounds. Who is going to beat Les Anderson's records? Kings over 120 pounds have been taken in fish traps and in the Bering Sea. Kings are big, but another popular Kenai salmon is the sockeye or red. Reds can be taken from the shore, and with a local permit, you can dip net. Check with the local state fishing game for current regulations. Sometimes one gets lucky and nets a king. But the norm is reds and more reds. The Kenai River is big, the salmon are plentiful, the kings rule with many fisher folks. People come to the Kenai River from every walk of life and from all over the world in search of catching a Kenai king. We're done bragging. Admit it. The Kenai River is unique even to Alaska. Kenai River kings are bulldog scrapping, hard diving, high jumping, pull the skiff till sundown, big. Let the salmon run, and they will come. Nobody had to say that, it just happened. Fifty or so years ago, a handful of homesteaders found a river and settled on it. The river is called the Kenai. The town is called Soldatna, now known as the River City. The salmon who call that river home go by the name of kings, reds, silvers, and pinks. Salmon all have one thing in common. Hooked on the line, they fight hard, and the person holding the rod is often known to scream incoherent sounds like, whoo ho or the like. <laughs> oh, a few of the calmer humans might even speak actual words and say, fish on. During the summer migration from May to September, most people know that the kings are the biggest, the reds are aplenty, and the silvers come into the reunion in the latter part of the season. But wait a minute, how about those pinks? Okay, you've caught a few fish in your day and somebody has held their nose up and got a little uppity when the word pink is mentioned. But next time you're in the grocery store, notice that that can on the shelf says pink salmon. Artists have called them the humpies from hell. What's a fish to do to gain respect? Do they deserve these derogatory remarks and labels? Consider this. There are a whole passel of people that have been thinking unkindly towards those pinks. So here's some inside info. Very few people are on the Kenai River in August and September. Oh yeah, those old reds fight hard, but so do the pinks. Hey, another thing to consider is the pinks actually bite that hook. But Humpy doesn't suffer from low self-esteem when you have them hooked on a the line. They fight. A Humpy has an average length of 20 to 25 inches. <laughs> this isn't a sardine or a smelt, this is a salmon. Humpy, <laughs> what an ungenerous name. You don't have a boat, you say, or waders. Well, Soldatna is the place for you. Soldatna has more river parks in the city limits than any place in Alaska. You don't need waders. There are parks with boardwalks. And if you do have waders, there are certain areas for river access. Some parks even have camping areas. Hello, I'm Andrew Carmichael. I'm the Parks and Rec Director for the city of Soldatna. And um, what we're doing today is going on a little river float cruising the Kenai River on the Alaska's Kenai Peninsula. The city of Soldatna has five river parks, Rotary Park, Swiftwater Park, Soldatna Creek Park, the Kenai River Classic Fish Walk right below the Visitor Center, and then the big boy of them all, Centennial Campground. The Rotary Park was, was actually one of the earlier parks developed for fishing with the Fish Walk. And it's kind of nice, it's a little bit out of the way. The plus about Rotary Park is that if you're staying in the campgrounds or you have a City of Soldatna day use season pass, it's valid here. It's actually the longest stretch of fish walk that we have, where you can actually fish from the um, 
fish from the shore without getting your feet wet. No waders, no boots, nothing but a rod you head to the shore with. Uh, 550 feet is what we've got down here in this area, so it works out pretty good. This fish walk is handicapped accessible, but a net is necessary to land the fish. In addition to the boardwalk, if you're not um, tuned, to the, tuned to the boardwalk and you just bought a brand new set of waders and if they don't come home with some fish slime on them, your wife's going to think you, maybe you didn't go fishing after all. You've got the lower end of rotary that's accessible by stairs, a short path across the short bridge, short walk down a big flight of stairs and you actually cross over part of the river and you can fish on the islands. If you are coming from Anchorage, take a left off the Sterling Highway onto Funny River Road. That is the first road after you cross the bridge on the south side of Soldat. At mile 2.5, you will find the parking area on the left just past the airport. Right on the tail of the last red run, the pinks come into the river in force. Pinks come in about the second week of August. The fun thing about pinks are that anybody can catch them and they'll bite on just about anything. Kind of like a little a short fish, a small fish's attitude. They'll hit on anything that comes in their area, be it bright and flashy, sometimes even dull. Not quite as big as the sockeye, but they're fantastic for the kids. That's the ones if you want to, you know, people want to get their kids interested in fishing. If they, if they take them fishing for pinks, it's almost a guarantee, and the fish are, the fish and the kids are hooked. 10:15 on August 8th. This one, the people in our booth in the campground start waving goodbye instead of waving hello. They, at that time, it's nice. It's, it's a little more quiet, and because um, we can accommodate almost 300 RVs total between the two campgrounds. And the odds are good. With about 5 million pinks in the river during a run, the chances of hooking up increase dramatically. One great thing about pinks is that compared to other species of salmon, they require less patience. They grow up feeding on plankton, larval fish, and occasionally insects. Consequently, they bite on almost anything. My name is Rob Massingo. I'm a sport fish biologist with the uh, Department of Fish and Game. And I primarily work with silver salmon, and in the process, we work with all species of salmon. A few years back at the sockeye sonar site, uh, that area has the ability to, to count fish as they go through. In 2000, the river just got bombarded with pinks. The range of five to 10 million has been suggested, uh, five probably being the more realistic number. You could hardly get a prop through some of the slow water times. You'd be hitting fish. They were so stacked up on each other. A lesson we constantly need to work on in life is how to hang in there. Catching pinks is a great way to gain fishing success, especially for those youngsters. Just downstream from Rotary Park on the other side of the river is Swiftwater Park. This 50-acre Primo site offers not only good fishing but camping and a boat launch. But for those without a boat, five platforms, boardwalks, and four stairs into the river are all offered in this secluded spot on the Kenai River. The 62 campsites on this beautiful stretch of river are just a bush and a tree away from downtown Savannah. One feature is 600 feet of wood handicapped accessible boardwalk that runs from the boat launch area. To get to Swiftwater coming from Anchorage, turn left onto East Redoubt just past the first stoplight by Fred Myers. Roughly a mile down the road, the road sign directs you to the right into the campground. Campsites are $11. One great spot for catching pinks is the calm area by the boat launch. Fishing in the water and not on the bank is not only healthy for the bank, but it's fun too. Each campsite has a picnic table and a fire pit, and firewood is available for purchase. Potable water is available at the well houses. The park also has an RV dump site. Every even-numbered year, the pink salmon run up the Kenai River in the hordes. This spot is also good for reds, but it's fabulous for pinks. Same people that come back each year, and they get the same parties going from year to year, as well as the fishing next to the same people, almost like a big family. They, you know, they, greet, they meet and greet here every, every summer. As far as for humpies and pinks go, this is a dynamite location with the platforms here, the slower water, the pinks like it, and the silvers love it as well. To be able to fish from the platform, again, not get wet. Uh, we've got a collection of both boardwalks and fish walk platforms that um, people can utilize to get to the fish. 
and come, come August, there'll be fish stacked in here like cordwood. Pink salmon is one of the most underrated fish I can think of. They got a bad rap for a couple of things. One, once they get in the river, they get ugly fast. In other words, they get those morphological features that kind of look spooky. They get all toothy, their kite, their snout gets overhanging. They get these wild colors and they don't even look like the same species they were. Uh, the key to get some good eating with pink salmon is to get them lower in the river when they're fresh. And there's a, a several day window period at least when these fish come in where they retain that bright silvery color. Their anatomy isn't changing a whole lot. They, uh, they're a wonderful eating fish. They have a light pink, great tasting flesh. Yeah, if you want to target a great eating fish, a fish that'll go um, aerial on you, uh, almost like catching a rainbow of the same size as uh, targeting these lower river fish when they're fresh and feisty. The Kenai River welcomes all manner of boats. It is not uncommon to find a canoe floating next to a kayak or some other hole in the water created for people to sit in and keep as dry and warm as possible. To fish salmon properly, stay off the bank. Fish from in the water. Little fish don't grow well in the fast lane. They need areas of quiet, a place to grow up. Trampled banks cause continuing erosion and destroy the salmon nursery. It has taken years to develop the bank erosion projects to benefit the future of the salmon and the future fishing potential of we who like to catch fish. What we call the Phillips Boardwalk or Fish Walk, Phillips Petroleum constructed it for the city about six years ago. And they um, built it the rig standards for the platform when they put it in. And it's fantastic fishing. When this project was put in, that the bank you see there with all the growth on it was a, was a completely eroded bluff. Each spring and um, summer when the heavy rains came, we would actually have to come down and do an analysis on trees on a daily basis because they, it was so eroded that full trees would, plow, uh, would drop off while people were fishing. Um, since we've got the, um, with the Youth Restoration Corps, did some work and the Phillips Boardwalk got the people off of the ground, being able to get to the river without without walking on the dirt and uh, further eroding the, the bank. A lot of places we put the boardwalk, we've also had to do restoration work as well, so protect the work and um, make it so we don't have to redo it again in a couple years. Some of the platforms that are there, the Army Corps of Engineers in conjunction with the City of Soldotna as well as Kenai River Sport Fishing Association um, did about $600,000 worth of restoration work and boardwalk installation to both um, provide some walking paths that weren't through the mud and protected the grass, but also some platforms that people can fish from. Try to funnel as many people as possible into protected bank areas as we can. Protect the riverbank from foot traffic and stuff like that, while at the same time being able to ensure the access. More than a few fisher folks these days practice catch and release. Stress less release is what we need to practice. Done properly, first, Try not to wear the fish out by playing it too long. To release the fish after removing the hook as gently as possible, keep it in the water and avoid touching it with dry hands. Hold the fish upright into the current, creating it gently by the belly. When the fish has recovered, it will swim out of your hand. This is Solatna Creek Park. It's got over 625 feet of boardwalk with river accesses into the stairs and it's right in Soldatna with the four sets of access stairs down into the river again to be able to get people into the water without having to go over the bank and, and damage the foliage. Provides excellent pink fishing as well as silver fishing. In the early mornings, early afternoons, late mornings, you name it, the fish are in the calmer stretches along the bank. Fish after fish after fish, tail to tail, fin to fin, almost walk on them. In a big river like this, you can imagine how many it takes to fill it up and they do a pretty good job of it. And people are asking why pink salmon males develop this huge hump. And that's again one of the big mysteries of pink salmon. I know that some people have looked at the body shape morphology of these males and they, for one thing, they tend to hold behind the females on their spawning beds. And that is a more hydraulically efficient shape, they believe. Uh, it could serve as an attractor to other females. Basically, the male with the biggest hump rules the spawn bed, and they're uh, 
their, their mating does uh, involve multiple partners. Um, they don't pair up just one on one and stay that way. Usually there's a number of males surrounding a receptive female and usually the male with the biggest hump wins. If you're staying at a hotel, Sylvana Creek Park's right downtown. It's kind of the edge of the wilderness in the city. You turn left on States Avenue, right by Pioneer Gardens, but there's no fee for Soldotna Creek. This is the lower portion of Soldotna Creek here, which is the old DOT lot. It's slated to be um, a facelift to it. We're just working on getting the funding together and getting some partners together, similar to what we did up at Swiftwater. This is a good example of why the boardwalks and fishwalks were created. Bank erosion is the enemy of young salmon. It takes away places for fish to spawn and places for young fry to develop. As we float downstream, our next fish walk is highly visible from the Soldatna Bridge. Right below the Soldatna Bridge is the, is the Kenai Classic fish walk. 400 feet of um, fantastic fishing, especially for, for silvers and, and pinks. My name is Justine Paulzine and I'm the Executive Director of the Soldatna Chamber of Commerce. We are on the Kenai River right in front of the Soldatna Visitor Information Center and the Chamber of Commerce office. The Chamber runs the Visitor Center for the city. Uh, so this is right down in front of our, our location there. And we help over 60,000 people in just the five summer months um, getting information and sending them throughout the state. Many accommodations that are available here in Solana are available right on the river. We also have a great web page that lists everybody um, that's out there, soldatnachamber.com. You can come down here, bring your lunch, sack lunch, pizza, whatever. We've got a picnic table down here so you can enjoy your lunch on this beautiful, uh, pristine fish walk. Nice thing about the platforms and the fish walks, uh, fish walk platforms, fish walk, is that people can come down and they can just grab a rod, whether they, if they don't want to have to buy waders or just coming up to Alaska and they want to experience the fishing, they can do it just by picking up a rod at the store. They don't have to invest in the hip boots and or the waders or anything else, come down in tennis shoes or come down with a lawn chair and sit back and have a soda while they fish. In Soldatna Mile 20, we're going to have millions and millions of fish passing through. Propaganda by probably the sport fishing crowd, I've been guilty of it in the past too, that boy, you've got a river full of salmon, you catch a pink, you try to shake it off so you can catch a more desirable fish and other people see that, that know nothing about salmon and it's kind of contagious to where you should be real happy that you got this good eating feisty little fish at the end of your line and, and uh, suddenly it turns into not such a desirable thing. There's nothing wrong with the pink salmon from the way it tastes to the way it fights. Pink salmon are ideal for smoking because of the higher fat content it uh, does lend itself well to smoking. Just an oar length or two away, we come to Centennial Park. This particular stretch of the river is closed to fishing from boats. You can't fish from the boats, which gives the, ang the bank anglers a good shot. It's a lot of people fish here for sockeyes, and, as well as silvers and pinks that are coming in later in the year. But um, with the 16 sets of stairs we've got going in here, we're able to funnel a lot of people in here from the campgrounds and protect the environment at the same time. Get them into the water and into the rocky areas in the water with the hip loop fishery without eroding the banks down. You can see the, the size of the stairs that look behind me that were foot traffic. Beautiful viewing platform that was put in for just that here, both um, river with the set of stairs and a possibility to hang out and um, enjoy the view of the river here. The, the area we're going through now you can see some of the effectiveness of it. This area was done in 97, as opposed to the area we just went through. This area was done five years ago, and you can see the size of the willows. All the willows that were there were put in as um, live stakes, approximately two feet long. You can see what kind of growth we've had. Just by being able to funnel the people into the, into the water through the stairs, um, just protecting the banks that much has allowed those willows to grow six, eight, ten feet tall just in a matter of five years. Both the fish like it, the moose like it, and actually ultimately the fishermen do because since the fish like it, it means more fish. Centennial has over 200 sites available to staying, especially when you're talking about August and September in the shoulder season when the silvers and the pinks are in. The 
uh, availability of campsites is usually pretty good. The reason people come to Centennial is number one, the fishing's great, number two, it's a gorgeous spot. All the campsites are within a three to four minute walk of the river. So you don't have to pull up, get in the vehicle, pack up everything in the car. You can take what the bare minimum and then carry your fish back. Three and a quarter million dollars worth of bank restoration, bank protection, and angler access projects that have been completed by the city of Soldatna. New tent sites, a number of those sites are for people, definitely perfect for people that might rent a car and um, throw the tent in the back after they get off the plane because we have some sites that are just um, for tent camping only. This year we've got the pinks coming, which are the extra bonus fish of the year. We've, last time they came up, they come up just in the even years. Wall to wall fish, fish after fish after fish, tail to tail, fin to fin, almost walk on them. In a big river like this, you can imagine how many it takes to fill it up. And, they do a pretty good job of it. The area down here you will need to have waders or hip boots to get to. Hip boots will be fine. Right now in Centennial we've got the stairs that we've been talking about headed into the river. Uh, you get to those via what 2,800 feet of graveled walkway, a little over a half mile. So you can walk along the river, through the trees, through the campground and enjoy the, the peace and quiet. And then about 300 feet elevated bard walk. Centennial has a 130 foot fish walk that's actually dedicated and uh, reserved for use by disabled visitors. It's got a wheelchair ramp, parking, handicapped parking right in front of it so that uh, visitors can wheel the wheelchair out of the vehicle down the ramp and be fishing within a matter of about 50, 60 feet. To get to this mecca from Anchorage, get in the right lane after crossing the Soldatna Bridge. At the stoplight, take a right on the California Ski Beach Road and then take the first right. You can't miss it, it's right there where it's at. One of the best areas to fish is at the boat launch. There is several hundred feet of bank allowing not only some elbow room, but a place to play those pinks and a good place to take a chair and keep an eye on the kids. The Centennial Swiftwater boat launches are fantastic in that they both have lagoons where there's um, the current um, is blocked up in this case and Swiftwater is blocked off by a jetty that was installed a number of years ago, so there's plenty of room to get people in. We've got the single ramp here at Swiftwater, and then um, two back down ramps at Centennial. And we would launch anywhere from 30 to 130 boats a day at times on the rivers between the two campgrounds. So it's a popular spot. Now, pink fishing is not only for kids, but every other year during the big run, Coca-Cola of Alaska sponsors the Kenai Kids Humpy Derby. It's open to any kid from anywhere that wants to have some fun and have the opportunity to win prizes. It takes place in early August. The kids can win fishing gear, bicycles, and of course, cases of Coca-Cola. Fish 24 hours a day for pinks. There's a six fish limit on the Kenai River, and uh, that's real easy to do. The season's uh, year-round on pinks. So Dotna has earned the name, the River City. It now has over 150 acres of river parks developed to accommodate fisher folks and to protect the bank and spawning areas of the salmon. And all of those fish walks, boardwalks, and stair accesses are wide open and willing during August and September when very few people are around. It is said that the best things often come in small packages. Success is not a matter of size. It's a matter of learning how to appreciate a life well spent. And as the river flows through Soldatna into eternity, those humpies will be coming back to serve their generations and ours with lessons of life. Since the days when the kayak was high tech to the paddle wheeler, cargo and passenger haulers that changed the nature of the Yukon River, people have lived on the water for a reason. In Alaska, rivers are a reason to settle. Rivers are transportation. Rivers are food sources. River banks are the places to build a village or a town. In summer and winter, Alaskan rivers are the intervillage connection between people and cultures. Boats built on the wooded banks of the Yukon River have been important for commerce and survival for as long as man can remember. As life became more stable, people found time for more recreation. Swimming failed to become an Olympic sport in the chilly waters of the Yukon. But as motors became more plentiful and efficient, boats got faster. 
We have found that certain people, when placed next to a machine, find speed as a preoccupation. On the Yukon River, boat racing started back in the middle of the 20th century. The grandest race of the Yukon River, which began in 1959, is still alive today. Called the ACS Yukon 800 Marathon, this annual race is held over the summer solstice. 800 refers to miles. 800 miles on the river, skimming the water as fast as you can in two legs on two consecutive days. The race starts on the Chena River in Fairbanks. The Chena runs through Fairbanks and is used by all. Canoes, jet skis, motorboats, and for the inventive independent Alaskan type, self-made boats and still the historical high-rolling paddle wheel river boats. Today, history shares the river system. A modern Yukon 800 racing boat passes a paddle wheeler that in days of yore was a water railroad hauling freight and passengers. Alaska Communications System in the year 2000 sponsored the Yukon 800 race and the Fairbanks Outboard Association was the organizer. The race has matured over the past decades. Today it utilizes the advantages of not only the knowledge of the river, but constantly uses new discoveries of hull design, engineering, props, and good old down-home experience. The Yukon River is not your gentle giant. It is a fast-moving piece of water with varying depths, side channels, submerged 60-foot floating logs, and toss in a sometimes chop that can pound the hull to death of a boat going up to 77 miles an hour non-stop for a six hour plus stretch. It's the longest, the toughest, the roughest river boat race in the world. Believe it. The race starts in Fairbanks on the Chena River. Just a few miles downstream, the Chena flows into the Tanana River. It goes by Ninana, Minto, and at Tanana runs into the Yukon. Downstream the boats go, past Ruby, until the first 400 mile day ends in Galena. At Galena, they will spend the night to rest and refuel, preparing for tomorrow's 400-mile leg back upstream to the finish. Pike's Landing in Fairbanks on the Chena is the ceremonial start. Kids, families, old-time racers all gather for the run. Last-minute adjustments and preparation take place before the launch. Seven boats are running this year. The water is slick. The crowd is in sleeveless tops. It looks like a grand day to go 400 miles down the mighty Yukon. The green flag waves go. 2000 Yukon 800 is off. The first boat down the channel is the Koyukuk Raiders, captained by A.J. Dick. Crew members Ted Jones and Lee McCotter in boat number 74. A.J. Dick, who grew up in Tanana, is the son of a former winner, Arlen Dick. A.J. is running a boat in remembrance of a friend. This year has been dedicated to Vernon Jones. He passed away last year, and I'm running his boat in honor of him. Archie Agnes from Rampart is a rookie captain running boat number 69, named Village Trash. Hey, let's have some fun, guys. Village Trash is crewed by Tom and Mike Wheel. Bill Page, captain of Jin Jin, boat number four, has won the race four times. Crew members are Matt Sam and Mark Huntington. Old time racer Mo Samuelson owns this boat, which was named Jin Jin for a reason. I named this boat after my little late granddaughter, which we had lost after she had just turned uh, four years old. And there goes Bill, starting in third position. Launching in boat number two is Click Bishop, a veteran of the Yukon 800. He won the race in 1998. This year, he is running Pride of the Yukon with crew Avery Thomas and Sue Meese. Well, I've got the only a woman crew member this year. Sue, she's raced uh, for the last 30 years, and I got her out of retirement a couple of years ago. Brian Kruger is a rookie captain running Millennium Edition number Ot Ot, crewed by Israel Silas and Arnold Huntington. And off goes Brian and crew. Harold Atla is the nephew of George Atla, the famous sprint musher. Harold, from Hughes, grew up racing on the Yukon. Harold, running number nine, Hughes Blues, has won three times in the past and holds a record for the fastest time. Off in position number six goes Hughes Blues, crewed by Hank Captain and Albert Atla. 
Boat number 91, Challenger, is manned by veteran Captain Victor Williams and crewed by Claude Koyakuk and Shane Fisher. And there they go, starting in last position. Leaving at two minute intervals, the restart of the race is at the campground where the time clock begins ticking. The boats are chewing up water right through town on the Chena River. This race is fast, it's strategy, but it is not a free for all. Some gotta haves are required. One gotta have is three crew members, and the crew does more than go along for the ride. It's a team effort and everybody has an assignment. The captain leads the team and steers the boat. The engineer watches the water and listens to the motor, and the navigator plots the course for the shortest distance between two points. The object is choosing a line that is obstacle free and avoid getting lost in a side channel. Reading the maps of the river course in depths is a crucial assignment. Yukon 800 boats are designed to be light and trim. The less water they touch, the faster they go. Getting on step close to immediate is critical. You will notice these boats are narrow. Making a turn is tricky if you want to stay upright. Weight distribution and leaning is an important job. To get on step quickly, the crew hangs over the bow. Careening around corners, the crew leans to compensate. This is how you maintain speeds up to 77 miles an hour with a 50 horsepower engine, which is the maximum allowed. That's only 50 horsepower, folks. 50, got it? 50 horsepower to gain 77 miles per hour. What a ratio. 10 miles south of the start, the race is in full throttle. Picking side channels between islands can save time. It can be a little tricky taking the short route, but experienced drivers will get on through, like behind the island up on the right. As you can see, straight lines in the Tanana are not standard issue. Some places water is exactly like a sandbar. Here the navigator is on duty and the more innovative you can be, the more time you save. Sam Dementif, a field officer of the BIA and a veteran of the Yukon 800, reveals a little secret. You run the main channels and you know the main channels, but in that racing you throw that all out because it's wherever there's enough eight inches of water and uh, straight on down. And you take all the risks again. And you can go in shallower water, all you have to do is raise your lift, lift the motor up further, and the motor will run dry for a few seconds, but you'll scoot across a gravel bar and get on the other side and quickly put it down. Between Nanana and the confluence of the Yukon River, the surface of the Tanana River is smooth as the boats put distance between each other. Jim Mobius, who has won the Yukon 800 several times, describes the course, which offers more than thrills. The course is probably uh, the big competitor. Uh, you talk about racing the other racers, uh, there's probably more camaraderie than there is uh, competition, although everybody wants to win the race, but the big uh, uh, opponent uh, competitor is the course itself. Uh, it's uh, 400 miles on three rivers. Uh, the, uh, the water, the weather is uh, varied. Uh, there are lots of hazards um, served up by Mother Nature, and it's not a course for the timid. Uh, you've got to get out there and, and run for uh, a number of hours uh, at full speed, and you're your body takes a beating. But the course is truly uh, befits the state we're in. Big, the water's big. Uh, we're looking at a boat here that's uh, maybe 18 inches from top to bottom, and there have been times when we've been out in water that's uh, where the waves are between three and four feet. Spotting plane monitors the course to check on the status of the racers. The excitement is running high, the racers hanging tough, bodies pounding on the decks. Meanwhile, in Tanana, the spectators enjoy a popsicle in the daily news, waiting for the race to come by. Betty Page, wife of Bill Page, is a former racer, and this year is the race coordinator and official timekeeper. Uh, do you know if we got a hand operator down here? Yeah, there he is, you're right there. Oh, okay, there he is. That's Kevin Avnet, a ham radio operator. To keep track of all these guys, uh, make sure that they get through all the checkpoints. French cuisine in Tanana is all the rage. All oh, the food here is excellent. First into Tanana and currently in first place is Click Bishop. A.J. Dick, Tanana hometown boy and number 74 is close behind.
Next is Harold Atlin, boat number nine, running strong. Coming in, Village Trash, run by Archie Agnes, Millennium Brian Kruger at the stick. And Victor Williams and his crew and Challenger chase the pack. The media is on the scene reporting live from Tanana. First of all, a lot of debris here on the uh, Tanana, and one of the boats actually hit a log coming through here. Bill Page is officially out of the race. His motor broke down, and he was headed back to Pike's Landing uh, as we speak. Should be arriving in there pretty soon. The weather just beautiful here in Tanana, and we'll have more coverage of the Yukon 800 from Galena in just a little while. For KFAR, I'm Rocky Barnett. Tanana, historically, before the influence of the outside, was traditionally a place where the natives of the interior traded. In fact, the historic native name translates as a place where two rivers meet. In 1880, the Alaska Commercial Company built the first trading post. The winding, twisting channels of the Tanana River demand strategy. Team efforts were tested to the max. Now as the boats leave the Tanana and enter the Yukon, the boats are on a different track, one that is straight and wide. Speed now dominates over strategy. Some problems can be more humorous than dangerous. Sam Dementoff told of the time the motor kept quitting. The crew would stand up and the motor would run, sit down and it would quit. The problem was solved when it was discovered one of them was sitting on the fuel line. The race is now on the Yukon River, which is Alaska's longest river, draining a third of the state, 330,000 square miles. It runs 1,400 miles from the Canadian border and dumps 1.9 million gallons of water into the Bering Sea every second. People have been living on this river 20,000 years, probably longer. The ancestors of these racers wouldn't believe the boats of the Yukon 800. Galena is the hub of six different villages. In 1919, it was founded as a supply point for Galena lead ore. Today, it is mostly populated by Koyukon Athabascans. The folks in Galena are patiently waiting on the beach for the boats to come in. For many years, the top management of the Alaska communication systems has given silver ingots to the leader at the halfway point. This year, the halfway trophy and cash was given in memory of Morris Thompson, the well-known, respected native leader. Mary Alexander and her husband, Wes, who won the Yukon 800 five years in a row, Mary explains the importance of the river to the people. It's a, it's a fun summertime event. It uh, gets everybody out, and everybody loves the river. That's what it's all about up here in the interior, is our rivers. From break up to freeze up, uh, you, you invent ways to be out and enjoying it. And uh, if you're not at fish camp, you're out picnicking, you're camping, you're somewhere in your boat. Click Bishop, the first boat into Galena this year, was the lucky winner of the halfway prize. He finished in five hours, 45 minutes. This year, the waters, the Yukon's just like, I mean, you can look at it here, it's like a flood stage. And, and uh, two years ago, the water was lower, so consequently, the, a lot of the shortcuts weren't open, and, and, and that goes for the Tanner River, too. It was uh, at six and a half feet two years ago, and now it's at uh, right at eight feet, so there's a lot of stuff opened up. The crowd cheers them in as A.J. Dick comes into Galena with Harold Atler riding his wake. Followed by Challenger. The boats and crew will spend the night in Galena, resting and preparing for tomorrow's return leg to Fairbanks. Sam Dementif explains the value of the river. Well, the native people are all river people. You know, it doesn't matter what they're in a canoe or, or a river boat or a, a freight boat or whatever it is, they're river people and they love it. They love being on the river. We know that uh, it's been a, like a uh, lifeline highway system, transportation route for them through the, through the uh, ages. Uh, my name is Michael Stickman. Uh, I'm with uh, Nolato, uh, from the village of Nolato. I'm the tribal chief there in Nolato, but I'm also the president of the village corporation, uh, which is consolidated with uh, four villages, Nolato, Caltech, Kaikuk, and Galena. And this here, we're standing before our lodge, Wakatma Lodge. Anything that uh, has to do with uh, taking care of the tribal members uh, from the young. Oh, there's a race boat coming in. The, the boat races here in Galena has uh, been a yearly tradition for as long as I can remember. Uh, 
must be Brian Kruger there. Uh, they were expecting and, and uh, waiting for uh, Brian Kruger. Uh, Brian Kruger is a, a resident uh, of Fairbanks, but he's a past resident. He grew up here in uh, Galena, so uh, that was probably his boat there. It's the excitement, uh, you know. Uh, also during the also during the uh, boat races, they have a, a, a inter-village uh, baseball tournament, a men's and a women's softball tournaments. Uh, all the villages from the surrounding area, Nolado, uh, Caltag, Kaikuk, Husalia, you know, uh, Alakakit, Hughes, you know, all the villagers they come here to, uh, you know, to see the boat races, but also to uh, to compete in the softball tournament. Any kind of sport that would uh, uh, bring happiness to people uh, is a good sport. Barges attend to the business of delivering goods while the race calls it a day. Dawn is a moot point during the summer solstice this far north. The sun merely takes a power nap. It is now 6 a.m. The captains and crew have hopefully had a good night's rest. The weather looks good. Two things have to be done. An upriver prop has to be put on the boat, and refueling is measured into the tanks. Going downstream, the boats could run with the strongest currents they could use. Going back upstream, the boats will choose the slack water and try to stay out of the main current. Like the boats, the props are highly technical. Thinner leading edges make a difference as does pitch for different conditions. Two basic boat designs are used. The open bow, apparent by the open deck, designed by Jim Mobius, and as Gustafson, Jim Mobius shows us some of the reasons for the design. Here, if you look at it, it's really shaped sort of like an airfoil, so that the air that's coming over the top acts much like a wing. The other design is the Star Wars, designed by Jerry Evans. The Star Wars, as you can see, has a center deck. Both boat designs draw as little water as possible. These 24-foot long boats have trade-off advantages. Star Wars boats handle better in rough water, and the open bow boats handle better in smooth water. A flare signals for the boats to jockey into position. We are here in Galena for the restart of the Yukon 800. It's uh, roughly 6 a.m., and the boats are all ready. I'm actually impressed that uh, everybody was, was good to go. And the boats are taking off there. Yeah, they got the flag and they're headed out. Click Bishop has the leader's advantage as they leave Galena, but it is 400 miles of Wilderness River. Betty Page recounts her former racing days. Very exciting. Uh, when the when the water's rough, then it's just really it's really really hard on the body, and I wonder why am I doing this? We ended up uh, we went across the wave of another boat and, and uh, the, the air trap caught and we done a 90 degree and headed right for a sand uh, bar and uh, we ended up like a full boat length and a half off of the, uh, of the river on the sandbar. We had to haul logs and put it underneath the boat to, uh, to get the, the boat back in the river and then take off again. Hopes are high going back upstream. The strategy upstream is to find that slack water to gain maximum speed up the strong currents of the Yukon River. Tim Jehola, this year's race marshal, awaits the racers in Tanana. Well, the trip back is between a, oh, a half hour, hour longer. The reason, reason for that is on the way down, you can see where the current flows. The, you'll see the racers run in the, in the fast water. And then on the way back, they'll run in the slack water. And what do I mean by slack water? You can see over on the south bank where the water's slower coming up upstream. Coming into Tanana, Click Bishop's wife is ready to take the portrait for the family album. Click is still in the lead, three quarters through the race. Change in the color of water indicates the change in rivers. The Tanana now offers its winding channels with the obstacles of an uphill current. And Click isn't holding that trophy yet. The other boats aren't far behind. As long as the gas holds out, the motor doesn't break down, a hidden log doesn't flip the craft, or a sandbar beaches a boat, it can be anybody's race. At this point, the question is, will the engine handle the stress? Will the racers handle the stress? You've got to have a rough water line all planned out. And 
because things are happening so fast. Um, the Yukon can kind of put you to sleep because uh, uh, the stretches are long, you've got uh, five or ten minutes to look at where you're going. The Tanana, everything picks up on the upstream side and um, after you've had this uh, opportunity to think ahead, things happen very quickly at the time when you're the most fatigued. At this point in the race, the bodies of the racers have also taken a beating. This is where you don't want to make a mistake due to fatigue. Re-engineering the water intake is standard for these custom boats. The intake is drilled into a point slightly below the shaft of the propeller, enabling the boats to run in shallow water. Passing by Ninana, the race heads into the last leg towards the Fairbanks finish. It makes good for uh, people knowing who's who and uh, like people up and down the river now who, who know who Ed Gustafson, who, who Jerry Evans is, who Bill, uh, Bill Page is, who uh, Wes Alexander is, and all the other racers. Everybody knows everybody else. It helps us get along in, in life. On to the last river. The blue water of the Chena flows into the muddy Tanana. The race comes back to the start in Fairbanks as the crowd waits at Pike's Landing. And around the last bin comes a winning boat. It's Click Bishop. Check one. Two. And here we have it. The winner coming across the line here at Pikes Landing in Fairbanks, Alaska. The winner of the 2000 ACS Yukon Alaska 800 Marathon. Well, there you have it, the 2000 ACS Yukon Alaska 800 Marathon, won in great fashion this year by number two, the Pride of the Yukon, piloted by Captain Click Bishop, with a final time of 12.22.56. People wondering if he's going to have a record, as he did have record time into Galena. No, he is 44 seconds shy of a record time in the Yukon Alaska 800 Marathon. Harold Atla and A.J. Dick cross the finish line together. Harold of Hughes Blues gets a second place finish with a time of 13 hours, 25 minutes. Taking the third spot is A.J. Dick, Koyukuk Raiders, 13 hours, 37 minutes. The checkered flag falls on this summer's race. Following fourth, Archie Agnes, Village Track. 14 hours, 57 minutes. And Brian Kruger comes in fifth with Millennium Edition in 16 hours and 33 minutes. Bill Page of Jin Jin and Victor Williams of Challenger both scratched. Click Bishop recounts the race. There's one stretch of the Yukon that I'm I, not real familiar with. I, I am, but I like to know exactly where I'm at at all times, and especially today in the smoke out there. If you don't know where you're at, you can get in this mason slough and take you a 12-mile trip out of your way. As the season sets on another summer solstice, the ACS Yukon 800 Marathon becomes a tradition in the north, bringing people together and uniting Alaskans. It has found its place in history and saved a place in the future.